Um, it reminded me of one story since we're on personal introductions. Uh, Cyrus is half Armenian and half German. And the Germans were not liked in my home uh, by my parents. And once I brought Cyrus home to meet my late mother, and I wasn't sure how it would go. She had very strong feelings about Germans of all generations. But it's always been a gratifying memory for me. If I remember correctly, and Cyrus can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, at the end of the afternoon, uh, as he was walking out, there were several friends who came over. She pulled him over to the side and she said something to the effect of, even if you're German, you're always German. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. Well, laughs> no, for me, uh, I guess you'd have to have grown up in my home to understand why that was a gratifying remark. It was, uh, you know, the ability of people to, uh, their reason and their principles of justice to transcend very strong personal feelings. Uh, <clears throat> and maybe that's what this evening is all about. Uh, trying to look at the facts, look at basic principles of justice, and see where they leave us. I was intending to speak for two hours, but I was told that I'll be limited to one hour, and I negotiate to one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, since I do believe that in this particular topic, the, uh, the devil is in the details, I'll just go as far as I go, and when it's time to stop, I'll stop, even though I won't get to the dramatic peroration. Uh, we'll just try to deal with covered material that I can and proceed from there. The topic I want to discuss this evening is a kind of paradox, namely, how does one account for the fact that so much controversy swirls around Jimmy Carter's book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, yet the actual content of the book is remarkably uncontroversial. Or, more broadly speaking, how do you account for the fact that so much controversy swirls around the Israel-Palestine conflict, yet if you look at the documentary record, the past, the human rights record, the present, or the diplomatic record for resolving the conflict, the future, once again, there's very little controversy. And the argument I'm going to make this evening, we'll see how far we can get into it, is that the vast preponderance of controversy <coughs> swirling around Jimmy Carter's book and more broadly the vast, the vast the preponderance of the controversy swirling around the Israel-Palestine conflict is fabricated, it's conjured up, it's contrived. And the purpose is to divert attention from the actual documentary record and to sow confusion about what that record actually shows. Let me begin with a more or less current example. In his book, Jimmy Carter devotes a considerable amount of space to the terrible destruction being wrought by the wall Israel is building in the occupied territories. At one point he writes, imprisonment wall is more descriptive than security fence. And the, the uh, crux of the book is really chapter 16, which he titles the wall as a prison. Uh, among the topics he discusses in that chapter, is the International Court of Justice decision from July 2004 on the wall that Israel is building. It was a milestone advisory opinion by the International Court, and it's a very interesting decision or opinion. Uh, most people presumably know the uh, final result of the decision, namely that the wall Israel's building is illegal under international law, Israel has to dismantle it, has to pay compensation, and so forth. But in fact, the really significant part of the decision, in my opinion, is not the opinion that was rendered on the wall, but what was rendered on all the related topics before they reached the opinion on the wall. That is to say, those of you who are familiar with the jargon of the Israel-Palestine so-called peace process, 
know that there's this uh, set of argument, set of uh, concerns which are called the final status issues. That is to say, those issues which are said to be so controversial that they have to be deferred to the last stage of negotiations. And those four issues, basically it's four, used to be five, now it's been cut down to four, are borders, settlements, Jerusalem, and the fourth, which the World Court doesn't address, but I'll get to later, the question of the refugees. Now, as it happens, the World Court, before it rendered its opinion on the legality of the wall, had to address all those other questions uh, as preliminary to rendering the decision. So first of all, it looked at the question of borders. What are the borders of Israel? What are the borders of the prospective Palestinian state? It states in the decision that under international law, it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. That principle, according to the uh, World Court, is anchored in Article 2 of the United Nations Charter. It's also anchored in United Nations resolutions, most famously UN Resolution 242, which begins in the preambular paragraph that it's emphasizing the inadmissibility of acquiring territory by war. The conclusion the court then reaches is that the territories Israel occupies, it has no title to them under international law. They are all, and the court keeps reiterating it throughout the decision, the opinion, they are all occupied Palestinian territory. Well, what does that mean? We're often told here that these are disputed territories. Not so, says the World Court. They are occupied Palestinian territory. You turn to Carter's book, and he writes that according to UN Resolution 242, and now I'm quoting him, Israel's acquisition of territory by force is illegal. Israel must withdraw from occupied territories. And Israel's borders must coincide with those of June 1967, apart from what he calls correctly mutually agreeable land swaps. Now, his main academic critic, in fact, he's had only one academic critic to date, namely Kenneth Stein, he says that's not true. He says nowhere does UN Resolution 242 mandate Israeli withdrawal from all territories taken in the 1967 war. And he says it is an invention on Carter's part. However, this is exactly what the resolution says and what the World Court decided. It is, to quote UN Resolution 242, it is inadmissible to acquire territory by war. And in the World Court's words, these territories, the, June, the territories occupied in June 1967, not some, but all, are occupied Palestinian territory. Case closed. Number two. The question of settlements. The World Court rules under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, an occupying power is prohibited from transferring its population to occupied territory. The World Court also cites the UN Security Council resolution from, 19, from March 1980, saying that the settlements constitute a flagrant, violation of in, uh, a flagrant violation of international law. Carter writes in his book, correctly, Israeli settlements in the West Bank and Gaza are illegal and obstacles to peace. That's the opinion of the World Court. That's also the opinion of the Security Council. Number three, East Jerusalem. We're told that's a very controversial question. In fact, Israel claims East Jerusalem 
as part of its eternal and undivided capital. But the World Court says no. It repeatedly states in its decision that East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. It refers to the West Bank, comma, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. There is no ambiguity whatsoever. In fact, if you go back to that March 1980 United Nations Security Council resolution, already there, they're referring to West Bank, comma, East Jerusalem. Well, some of you are thinking, so what, what the World Court says? <laughs> 